Hello, I'm John Rossi, a touring drummer with a love of all things animal. When I'm on the road, I visit as many zoos, aquariums. Hey, wait a minute. What's going on? Hey, what's going on there? Hello? Hello? We interrupt your regularly scheduled program to bring you Rossafari Zoo News. News you can use from the world of zoos and conservation. Every week, we bring you breaking news and analysis from around the globe, featuring the animals you love and the people who care for them. And here's your anchorman, John Rossi. Hello, 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 and welcome back to another episode of Rossafari Zoo News, your look at everything going on in the world of zoos, aquariums, conservation, and general animal weirdness. Um, I want to start off this week by um, saying that uh, I, I've gotten a couple of messages over the last couple of weeks where people asked me why I didn't list their name at the end of Zoo News. And uh, every once in a while, I will make a mistake. It's all me doing the clerical work. I've mentioned that before. But um, in this case, that wasn't quite what had happened. Uh, it turns out that, honestly, um, my social media stuff has been really popping lately, which is pretty great. And um, because of that, I've just not been seeing notifications as much as I normally do. So um, if you send me stuff, I always see it. If you DM me or, or email it to me. But uh, if you tag me, there's a chance that I've missed you in the last couple of weeks. And if that is the case, I do apologize for that. Uh, this is especially true on Instagram, where um, some of my posts have gone from like 70 likes to like 1200 likes, which is pretty great. Uh, it's, it's been a good time. It turns out that people really like baby red pandas and binturongs and such. Who knew? Uh, I did. I, I knew. But yeah, so um, that has been happening, and this is such a humble brag, but uh, no, I honestly just wanted to say that if I've missed you tagging me in anything, uh, I do apologize, and I do appreciate that y'all are doing it. And now that I'm aware of that, I know how to search for tags to make sure that I hopefully don't miss anything. So um, yay, increased engagement, and yay, not letting it affect Zoo News. Uh, other than that, not a ton to report from this week. I was up, as you may have noticed uh, from my Instagram, at Roger Williams Park Zoo this week with our good friend Danny Poirier Larson and also with Zoe. And uh, we got to go hang out with a very, very special future guest of the pod. Uh, we actually spent the entire day with the Bird Show team there. And this is a team that is from NEI, uh, Natural Encounters, Inc., the company that Steve Martin is the uh, founder and president of. You'll, you'll remember him from uh, an episode earlier this season. It was, it was the most talked about episode to date. And uh, I, I get to bring you now not only another person from that incredible organization, but a really deep dive into what goes into a bird show. And y'all, it's a lot. We got to attend three shows that day, both uh, from the front and behind the scenes. And we got to go back behind the scenes at like the holding area and see how everything is put together. We got to attend the team meetings where they discussed the shows and talked about their upcoming plans. It was a, an unprecedented level of like deep diving. And then we got to do an interview um, with with Amy, with Amy Fennell, who is running the program up there. She's amazing. So I can't wait to share all of that with y'all. But uh, that's still a ways away. Um, and also, I guess a friendly reminder now, as we are heading into September, you'll be listening to this, uh, well, it's a dropping anyway, on September 1st, um, but I'm going to be attending three different conferences during the month of September. And so uh, Zoo News in particular may get a little wonky as I try and make sure that we get coverage of those conferences and talk about that stuff, but keep sending me stuff and I'll keep cranking out uh, episodes as I can and, and we'll, we'll figure it all out together. We'll all hold hands and sing kumbaya and, and make it work. So just know that um, that is coming up uh, later this month, and I'm excited to, to share all of that with you. I've already got a bunch of interviews scheduled for those conferences, and I'm still working on more cool surprise stuff. So uh, yeah, that's it for the update. And now let's get to Zoo News. One, two, three, four. Oh, there's a funky monkey. Treat kangaroo. Or a binturong. It's Zoo News. Yeah. 
All right, y'all. So as has become our tradition, we are going to start with births and then move on to deaths and then move on to the other Zoo News stuff. Um, this week, we've got a lot of births, like a lot. So uh, I apologize if I don't give these quite as much individualized attention as I usually do, but um, I want to make sure we get to them all. So let's get into it. First of all, it is still red panda birth season, and Binder Park Zoo has announced the birth of a red pandlet named Zin, and Zin is able to be seen on exhibit at this point, so that's pretty exciting. We've also got a single red panda that was born at the Belfast Zoo, but we don't have a name for that one yet, so two new pandlets have uh, joined, joined the party here. And then uh, we actually have two more pandas to talk about, but the other kind, the imposters, the bears, there were two giant panda cubs born at Everland Zoo recently. And, uh, you know, outside of China, you just don't hear of a lot of uh, giant panda births anymore. So it's always really exciting to get to share those types of stories. So, um, yay, giant panda cubs. But of course, on this podcast, we have to say even more yay to the, uh, the new red panda cubs that are out in the world. Cape May County Zoo has announced the birth of a male American bison calf to parents Beverly and Hank. The calf is uh, brand new, but already weighs around 50 pounds and uh, is particularly adorable. Uh, since the uh, the calf does need to be around mom to nurse and stuff, you can already see this little cutie out on exhibit. Very exciting stuff. Love to hear about a new bicelet. The uh, Zoo Miami team has announced the birth of a brand new Adra Gazelle, which is a really slender, really, really beautiful uh, cliffstock species uh, with cool little curved horns. Highly suggest that you check that out. Very, very cute. Very cute indeed. And um, yeah, we'll keep moving along with these births here. Um, there is a brand new baby ostrich running around at the Toledo Zoo. This is a ostrich chick or an ostlet, uh, which is known as Denny. And Denny has the habit of doing happy spins when running around his exhibit in the barnyard at the Toledo Zoo. So if you happen to be able to get to uh, the Toledo Zoo or check out their social media at the Toledo Zoo, uh, you, you can see some video of Denny the Ostrich Chick running around and doing happy spins. And uh, y'all, they will make you happy as well. 22 Burmese mountain tortoises have recently been born at the San Antonio Zoo, and this is an endangered species, so uh, it's really, really exciting that uh, these have been born. Uh, the the um, mothers of the turtles are named Scarlet and Large Marge, and they share a father named Colton II. I don't know why it's not Colton Jr., but uh, this is the first time that this species has ever hatched at the San Antonio Zoo, and as such, it is really, really exciting news. And actually, the San Antonio Zoo has also announced the birth of a secretary bird, a secklet? Secretary Birdlet? That's a tough one. I'm going with Secklet, uh, which is also the first time that uh, this species has been born there in over 15 years. So uh, some really cool births happening uh, this week at the San Antonio Zoo. The Virginia Zoo has announced the birth of a baby male Maasai giraffe named Henry. And uh, Henry is awesome, not just because giraffelets are amazing, um, but because uh, the mother is Noelle and the father is Billy, who passed away earlier this year and was an absolutely beloved member of the giraffe herd at the Virginia Zoo. So it's really cool that even though dad is gone, baby gets to live on and thrive. The North Carolina Zoo has announced the birth of four horned puffin chicks. Now, for me, that would be pufflets, but I have to admit, it's pretty cute. The actual word for baby puffins, along with chicks, is 
pufflings. And pufflings is as cute as pufflets. So while I think we should stick with lits for everything, pufflings does have a special place in my heart. And actually, uh, they're not the only facility that is announcing a pufflet birth right now. Uh, because it turns out that um, the Seattle Aquarium has announced the birth of a single pufflet. So that is four at North Carolina and one at Seattle for a grand total of carry the one and uh, divide by the age of the okay five five new pufflets that we're announcing this week. So uh, very, very exciting stuff. We've also got some really good news out of the Denver Zoo, which this week announced the birth of a new baby mandrel, a mandlet, and also a new baby orangutan, an oranglet. So uh, lots of cool primate births happening at the Denver Zoo this week. And then uh, we have three more births still to announce, all of which are pretty cool. There are three new lion cubs, lilits, at Tanganyika Wildlife Park. These guys are really cute, y'all, and I highly recommend checking out their social media because lilacs are, like, extra adorable. And then um, the San Diego Zoo has announced the birth of three new baby beavers, y'all. I love beavers so much. And uh, again, you can go to at San Diego Zoo to see adorable video of these little guys. Um, their names are Rogue, River, and Willow. And I am just so touched by all of that. So congrats to the team at the San Diego Zoo. And then the last one that we need to talk about this week for our births is from our good friends at the Fort Worth Zoo. And um, these are garial babies. So uh, garlets, whatever, who cares? This is, this is more important than the lit story, okay? So the moms are Rainy and Snaggle, and the dad is Big Boy, who is like the icon of the Fort Worth Zoo. Um, if you've been to the Fort Worth Zoo, you have pictures of Big Boy. He's, he's a garial, and he's just... Um, well, he's a very big boy. He's he's the biggest gharial in the United States. Uh, this also marks the first time uh, that any zoo in the nation has bred multiple offspring of gharials, which are critically endangered. So that's, that's really good and really important. Um, but going further than that, uh, it's it's worth mentioning that they have been trying to breed this species at this zoo for decades with incredibly limited success. Just in general, even out in the wild, gharials have low fertility amongst their clutches, meaning that many eggs either hatch too early or don't hatch at all. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's just something where gharials struggle in general. And then when you put them into captivity, you have to figure out the best uh, way to, to make them comfortable and make everything work properly. And they have been studying this for a long, long time. Uh, sometimes with uh, ectotherms, it can be a matter of a degree or two, uh, whether or not, you know, eggs will hatch properly and everything. So the fact that the Fort Worth Zoo dialed this in and had this successful birth of four baby gharials is absolutely beautiful and absolutely incredible. And of course, the knowledge that they have gained in, in making this happen uh, will be shared with the, the rest of the community. And hopefully this can be a huge step for helping to save this species. So congratulations to the incredible ectotherm team at the Fort Worth Zoo. And of course, after all of that joy, we then need to get to the sad stuff, which are the deaths that have happened. And uh, much like last week, y'all, we got some doozies this week, so I apologize for that in advance. Um, first of all, a Cheyenne Mountain Zoo announced the passing of two-year-old female Amur Tiger Mila. Now, um, Mila is a name that you might recognize because uh, Mila was a cub that was born at the Toronto Zoo. 
and her playful attitude and curiosity made her a celebrity not just at the Toronto Zoo, but um, online as well. And when she started to show that she was ready to be independent, she got a breeding wreck to move to the Cheyenne Mountain Zoo, where she was going to be mating with uh, their male, Amor Tiger, uh, named Chewy. And uh, the Toronto Zoo did a big goodbye party for her, and, and it was a, a really big deal. Mila is truly beloved. I know I ran up and saw her when she was still a cub, because how could I not? It's Mila. Uh, unfortunately, um, after she arrived at Cheyenne Mountain Zoo, uh, they realized that she had a severe dental issue that was more than a cavity and that was advancing towards her sinuses, so if left untreated, would have been fatal. The team came together and decided that they were going to do the treatment. They worked with Mila on um, getting her voluntary injection training uh, back up to snuff. They had worked on it hard at the Toronto Zoo, and uh, they made sure that it was really good at Cheyenne Mountain as well. And uh, they gave her an injection of her initial anesthesia, at which point she jumped up on a bench in her holding area where she began to lay down to uh, fall asleep. And then less than a minute after lying down, uh, she slipped off the bench, which was about waist high for a human. And the way that she fell, it caused a fatal spinal injury. And now Mila is gone. Um, the vet who uh, administered the anesthesia has said, and others have confirmed, that um, having a bench of that height in there with her would not be considered an issue. Uh, even if she would fall off of it, the odds of her falling in a very specific way that would cause this kind of injury were um, next to zero, but apparently they weren't zero and Mila fell in exactly that way. And unfortunately is now gone. Um, it's, it's a truly heartbreaking story. Uh, both Cheyenne Mountain Zoo and the Toronto Zoo um, have been mourning her very publicly and have been talking about uh, what an amazing tiger Mila was. Uh, and she, she really was. Um, and, you know, as you can imagine... Um, it's a true nightmare scenario. Uh, I actually um, had a bunch of people send me the story, and it was when I was driving back to Danny's house from Roger Williams Park Zoo. So it was Danny and Zoe and I in the car together, and um, I, I could see that messages were coming in, but I was driving, so I didn't want to look at them, and I was just like, hey guys, did something happen with like the Toronto Zoo and Cheyenne Mountain Zoo today? I, I have, My phone is blowing up, and I, I can't look at it. And um, Zoe found the, the story and shared it with us. And we had just had like the most perfect day. It was so great. We were all having such a great time at Roger Williams. And the car just went really silent. And I thought it was so interesting because I was immediately thinking about how to broach the subject on Zoo News and how to, to approach it in a compassionate yet honest way and, uh, and share my own feelings as well as just missing the tiger cub that I loved. And I could tell that Zoe, a vet, had to be thinking about, you know, what that poor vet must be going through and how terrifying and horrible that is and how much guilt there must be with that. And again, I'm, I'm assuming here because we were being quiet and not talking, but um, I'm also assuming that Danny, as, as a keeper and as a trainer, had to be thinking about what that would feel like if that happened to one of her animals. So uh, it, it was an interesting car to be in as that got announced. Um, so, you know, obviously sending love and condolences to the team at Cheyenne Mountain Zoo and the Toronto Zoo, um, but also like, you know, I just want to remind everyone this stuff does happen. It is the hard part of, of zoos and, and that we love so much, you know? Um, and it's, it's terrible to see it happen, but it was an accident and it was a freak accident. And what is not an accident is the people who are going online and being absolute trolls and absolutely horrible about this. Um, including people who love the Toronto Zoo and are big Toronto Zoo fans going and pooping all over Cheyenne Mountain Zoo on their posts and saying they're horrible facility and stuff. And people going to the Toronto Zoo and saying they were evil for sending her off, um, even though it was an SSP breeding wreck. Like, it's gross, y'all. Stay out of the comments section. 
Uh, but just a friendly reminder to anyone listening to this, you know, when you have an emotional response to something, it's okay to not vent about it online and take it out on the people who are the most affected by it. I'm guessing that nobody in my audience is that person. Um, I feel like you have to have a lot of compassion if you're going to be this invested in zoo animals and understanding how zoos work and getting to know the people behind all that stuff. But just in case I'm wrong, I had to say it. Uh, don't don't be a jerk is a is a pretty good uh, mantra. So um, not only am I sending condolences to the teams at both facilities for their loss, but also for having to put up with the absolutely horrible people out there. And hold on to your butts, y'all, because we're not anywhere near done with the deaths yet. Uh, the next one that we need to discuss is that unfortunately. Baby Ty, the red panda cub at Wingham Wildlife Park that we announced a few weeks ago, uh, has passed away. Uh, she recently had her vet checkup and was doing fine. She had been growing steadily and there were no signs of anything wrong. But apparently uh, underneath that healthy exterior, she had some hidden health issues and uh, she passed away from liver failure. Uh, just a, a hidden killer. They did not know. And then she was gone. So, uh... While we've been celebrating all the births of red pandas uh, in, in the world lately, um, you know, it's worth remembering that they are a a very, um, they're not a very hardy species, to be honest. There's a reason that a lot of zoos wait until they're a few months old to even announce the births. And uh, yeah, so just just a very sad story of, of an unexpected loss of a, of a red panda cub. And that's not the only recently announced uh, birth that we've had to say goodbye to this week. Um, the Fort Worth Children's Zoo, a week after announcing the birth of their baby orangutan, has announced that it has passed away. Um, he was only around for about a week, but uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, that's all they, the time they got with him. It's, it's a really sad story, and Tara, his mother, uh, is absolutely grieving over uh, the loss of her baby. Um, she did get time to say goodbye to it, and um, the, uh, the care team and the troop have been taking care of her, but uh, she has not been going out on exhibit and has genuinely been really sad about it, which, I don't know, just makes it sting a little bit more, I think. So sending our love and condolences to the team at the Fort Wayne Children's Zoo. The Jacksonville Zoo has announced the passing of uh, Lucy, a beloved 12-year-old Sumatran tiger who passed away unexpectedly. Lucy uh, had had a ton of different health issues over the years, and um, she always seemed to bounce back, but she was just one of those animals that was never really super healthy. And uh, it turns out that a necropsy revealed signs of sepsis, which is uh, a blood-borne infection, uh, which was likely the cause of death. Despite all of her issues, she did raise two litters of healthy cubs at the zoo and was actually a really uh, good mom. Um, she was very playful and um, would oftentimes chill right by the pool, which is uh, how I remember seeing her. Uh, she also would frequently take a nap uh, while lying on her back with her feet up in the air. So um, just another sad and, and unexpected loss, uh, at, you know, this time uh, at Jacksonville. So Goodbye, Lucy. And then last but not least in the animal deaths this week, our good friends at the Trevor Zoo have announced the passing of Betty, their resident bobcat, who was 13 years old. Uh, Betty had lived at the zoo for a long time and um, was a very old bobcat. So while they are still awaiting necropsy results, it is believed that uh, something age-related is, is what... Um, took her down and uh yeah it's it's really sad she was a very very beloved uh animal at the zoo both for um the the guests and the staff and uh she also uh was on their youtube channel uh for their live from the trevor zoo episode number 110 which featured betty so um for the moment her exhibit is going to remain empty as a tribute to this beloved animal sending love to the team at the trevor zoo now while we are done with animal deaths there are two human deaths that I want to address at this time. The first of those is Bob Barker, the host of The Price is Right, who passed away at the age of 99. 
You know, it's pretty awesome that he almost hit a dollar, but didn't go over. Nice job, Bob. But what a lot of people know about Bob Barker, along with the hosting, is that he was an advocate for having your pets spayed and neutered, which is true and which is a great message and which is really important for controlling, you know, the dog and cat populations. What less people know about Bob Barker is that he was a true lover of all wildlife and uh, frequently donated time and money to wildlife causes outside of having animals spayed and neutered. He was a very generous donor to Chimp Haven, and in fact, in 2012, he visited Chimp Haven after donating a bunch of money there to celebrate the opening of the multi-acre forested habitat that that money went towards, where chimpanzee groups have lived ever since. Um, he actually uh, got on the radio to signal the official release of chimps into the habitat for the first time with an enthusiastic, Chimps, come on down! So uh, live in that Price is Right dream, y'all. But yeah, it's just very cool to know that Bob Barker was so involved with conservation work and taking care of chimps and loving all kinds of animals, not just dogs and cats, although let's be honest dogs and cats you know that advocacy work that's more than most people ever did on its own so the world lost a very amazing man uh when bob barker passed away and though he was less famous the world also lost an amazing man this week in the form of dr mike cranfield who was a former veterinarian at the maryland zoo who worked there for over 25 years doing vet work but also constantly going out into the field to help with wildlife vet work and wildlife conservation he was a really good person who did a lot to build the uh, amazing place that the maryland Maryland Zoo is, and also to help out with animals in the wild. So he truly will be missed. And okay, I know that was a lot of births and a lot of death and a lot of heavy stuff right there. So uh, let's let's throw it to someone who isn't me for a moment. Hi, it's Becca and Jessica from the Greensboro Science Center. And we would like to invite you out on September 16th from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. to celebrate Red Panda Day with us. Stop by our educational tables to learn more about these elusive and endangered animals. And you can also purchase prints and paintings done by our very own red pandas, Zuko, Azula, and Miso. You can also purchase paintings by Ravi, Tai, and Usha, with all proceeds going to Red Panda Conservation. That's right, y'all. All of that money will be going to Red Panda Network. Yay! And uh, the prints are adorable. If you haven't seen this yet, you need to go look at my Instagram or Facebook because I got to be there for the panda painting with the three cubs. And it was adorable and it was fun. And uh, let's just say that I have a sock that is now completely animal artwork. I also have a pair of shorts that is currently animal artwork, although I should probably wash them, maybe. But anyway, this is a great opportunity to go and support Greensboro Science Center and to uh, to get some really cool art from the pamphlets that you've been hearing and seeing so much about on the podcast and my social media. Um, and don't forget, though, uh, Saturday, September 16th is International Red Panda Day. And if you can't get to Greensboro Science Center, if you have a zoo around that has red pandas they might be doing an event as well i'm working on trying to be at an event this year uh, i can't say where yet we'll see if it happens but i'm gonna try to make it happen so um fingers crossed and don't forget to get out there and see what cool red panda events you can find at your local zoo and speaking of local zoos, my home zoo, Elmwood Park Zoo, has recently announced an interesting treatment that they have going on for one of their giraffes. We're talking about Gerald the giraffe, and Gerald is just a very special giraffe at the zoo. Uh, you can identify Gerald when you're there because he's the one who will be drooling and putting his mouth on things he shouldn't, like railings and uh, fencing and stuff like that. Gerald's just what everybody calls a very 
special boy. And part of that is that Gerald has had a long history of medical issues that have required extensive care, uh, which actually includes fractures to bones in both of his front feet. Ouch. Gerald has recovered from those, um, but he does need ongoing care. And even though he's not currently showing any signs of discomfort, the vet team at Elmwood Park Zoo uh, decided to try to give him a special treatment that uses deoxyfin, which is a medical grade carbon dioxide, to uh, reduce inflammation and stimulate blood flow. So the way this works is Gerald enters his training tower and puts his foot up on a block, which is a training that I actually got to see them working on with him a couple years ago uh, to get laser treatment for this stuff. Um, after he gets his foot up there, the, uh, the vet team wets his leg, which helps increase diffusion, then puts a bag over his hoof and fills it with the carbon dioxide. This treatment is known as a transdermal deoxyfin treatment, and it prompts the body to pump more oxygen to his foot. They leave the bag on for 20 minutes while giving Gerald lots and lots and lots of snacks, and then they remove the bag. This is such a testament to a zoo going out of its way to make the life of an animal better, even when it's not showing discomfort, and also such a testament to the amazing training work that they do to have a giraffe be able to hang out with his foot up on a thing in a bag for 20 minutes. Th these are animals that spook easily and run away, y'all. Like, that's really, really incredible. Um... It's extra incredible because, like I said, I got to watch uh, some early training for a different procedure, but th this is the same training. And, um, you know, it was slow going. The team really needed to work with him and and build that trust bucket. And um, ah, I just could not be any prouder of the team at Elmwood Park Zoo. That's just that's the kind of stuff that that makes me always say that zoos are just amazing. And speaking of amazing things at zoos, uh, one of my favorite things at the Nashville Zoo is that their nursery uh, at their veterinary hospital is open to public viewing. It's through glass, but it's it's open to public viewing. It's actually the first time I ever saw uh, baby binturongs, bintlets. I, I saw the batch that had Lucille, who is now at Cincinnati, and... Um, my breath was taken away seeing those little goobers. And the Nashville Zoo has announced uh, that they currently have a clouded leopard cub and a banded palm civet kit, both on exhibit at their nurseries. So uh, while while they are there, you got to try to go, um, especially to see a civet, which is very rare in captivity in general. So I highly recommend that if you can get to the Nashville Zoo, you check that out. A 500-pound black bear who gained viral fame as uh, Hank the Tank has been rehomed uh, to the Wild Animal Refuge near Springfield, Colorado. Hank is now referred to as Henrietta because uh, it turns out that that the the experts online weren't weren't able to tell that it was a female bear is doing well and uh, is is getting situated in it. It's very cool that the Colorado Parks and Wildlife Department and the Department of Agriculture in Colorado allowed this uh, to happen because as of right now, um, in general, nuanced bears are only allowed to be accepted uh, into the state once a year. And, um, you know, hopefully with the fame that this brings in and people's interest, Henrietta will, will make it so that the state allows these sanctuaries to bring in more nuisance bears because it's good for the bears and the people who are no longer being nuisanced nuisanceified nuisanated something like that anyway very cool story and speaking of cool stories our friends at the central florida zoo have announced that they have had 76 eastern indigo snakes hatch at their center for indigo conservation uh, these snakes start their life there and then uh, from there, 30 of them are transferred to Zoo Atlanta, while another 30 go to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Wallaca National Fish Hatchery. The snakes are raised there for two years, 
as part of a Head Start program before being reintroduced to its native territory because they are a threatened species. So again, just amazing conservation work being done by a zoo uh, about an animal that, you know, they're not displaying. They don't get anything from it other than they're helping to save that threatened species, which is a beautiful, beautiful thing. And they're not the only zoo that are doing that. I mean, we all know that. We talk about that all, all the time. But uh, in this case, uh, the Oregon Zoo has announced that they will be releasing a bunch of northern leopard frogs into the wild. This is a population that is dwindling, and because of how easy it is to get the eggs and raise northern leopard frogs, the zoo was able to literally release hundreds of them into the wild in one go, which is just an absolutely amazing and, and beautiful story. I love it. All right, so recently I talked to y'all about the fact that the Seneca Park Zoo announced that their giraffe, Capenzi, had a growth on uh, her jaw that was really problematic, and they were going to be doing a biopsy on it and uh, hopefully removing it and, and wanted to let the public know that like they knew that this was a problem and that the surgery was coming. Well, they have now announced an update on Capenzi, and it's it's not great news. Uh, the biopsy test results revealed that the growth is a type of cancer called squamous cell carcinoma, which is invasive throughout the jawbone. Uh, given where the tumor is located in the jaw, there is no way to remove it without compromising Capenzi's ability to eat and ruminate, according to the veterinarian at the zoo. And as such, the prognosis is poor. It's a very rare type of tumor in giraffes, but uh, in the few cases that have been reported, the cancer ends up spreading into the lymph nodes. Uh, so at this time, Capenzi is doing very well and does not even require any medication. She is showing no signs of discomfort and is is eating well. The team will be monitoring her closely, uh, including monitoring her daily appetite and reporting any decreases in the amount she eats. Weekly exams and weekly weigh-ins will track the way um, she is, is taking in that food, and uh, they will also track the way she holds her jaw and chews, and, um, you know, it'll even get to the point where they're going to be taking x-rays of uh, her teeth once a month to, to make sure that everything is okay there. Um, but at some point, you know, this is going to catch up to Capenzi and, uh, th this will be the beginning of the end of, of her life. It could be a long one still, or it could be a quick one. Uh, but I, I really, uh, admire the Seneca Park Zoo for being so transparent about all of this. This week, zoos have had to close in both California and Florida because of tropical storms raging up and down the coasts on each side of the country. As a matter of fact, the closures even uh, moved up as far as Georgia and South Carolina on the East Coast. Um, I think the most northern place that I saw was the South Carolina Aquarium had to close for two days because of the storms. Uh, these facilities are all, you know, great at knowing what they need to do. And um, at the time of my recording of this... Uh, uh, there has been nothing announced about anything really bad happening other than some basic storm damage that needs to be fixed uh, and, and those closures. But yeah, so it's, it's kind of crazy that there were these, these huge tropical storms happening on both sides of the country at the same time. And uh, there was actually another zoo that had to close unexpectedly this week. The National Zoo had to close early one day when they got a bomb threat that seemed credible. Now, luckily, um, the uh, the Metropolitan Police showed up and were able to um, to announce that there was no bomb present. But the zoo was not able to reopen that day because of their normal schedule uh, and did open the next day. So uh, just just kind of a, a pointless, stupid bomb threat shutting down the National Zoo for half a day. All right, let's do some quick hit stories here. The Cape May County Zoo has been officially named the best family attraction at the Jersey Shore. Uh, so that is according to the Jersey Shore Awards, which they seem like they would know. So uh, congrats to the team at the Cape May County Zoo for that. 
The Naples Zoo has announced pints for parrots at Casey's Parrot 41 Bar and Grill from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. on Saturday, September 16th. So if you're in Florida and uh, you can't go and go to any International Red Panda Day stuff because it's too hot down there for red pandas to be anywhere in Florida, so you can go out to Naples and help support the Naples Zoo. This is a great example of what I was just talking about last week of, you know, a zoo partnering with a local uh, business to help support the zoo. So I just think that's really, really cool. Uh, four quick ones out of the Columbus Zoo. Uh, first of all, the Columbus Fire Department will be spending time at Zumbezi Bay, the water park at the zoo, uh, working on various water rescues. It's really cool that they have a place to be able to do that uh, right there at the zoo. So it's, it's cool that the zoo is letting them do that. The Columbus Zoo also announced that they are introducing their new male elephant to their elephant herd. And they are doing this as kind of a um, a slow rollout. Um, so uh, the the team right now is introducing um, Sabu to uh, the rest of the herd. Sabu is their new male elephant, and uh, right now he'll be like going out for an hour, then two hours, and three hours, and it'll keep increasing. So uh, it's it's going to be limited right now. But if you're really lucky and you time it right, you can go and see Sabu uh, hanging out with the rest of the elephants at the Columbus Zoo. The Columbus Zoo has also announced pregnancies uh, of their mother, uh, Faith, who is a bonobo, and Kali, who is a Bornean orangutan. And uh, they are both due to have their lits in uh, late autumn 2023. Uh, I think it's really cool that they are announcing this early so that we can follow along with the pregnancies, even though it's, you know, always risky. Um, this is the first time that an orangutan will be born at the zoo in uh, 60 plus years and um, would be the first bonobo born in the U.S. in three years. So very exciting news there from the Columbus Zoo. And then last from the Columbus Zoo, uh, they are replacing their train, which is a gas train with an electric one. So there may be some service interruptions, but um, yeah, they're doing what is best for the environment. And uh, you got to love that. The Monterey Bay Aquarium announced the um, 24th birthday of Rosa, which they celebrated with an entire week dedicated to celebrating this gorgeous sea otter. Uh, Rosa was rescued as a one-month-old pup uh, back in 1999 and cared for by the aquarium and uh, has been living there ever since, joining the Sea Otters exhibit back in 2002. And uh, she became a surrogate mother to many other orphaned sea otter pups. We've talked about that uh, here on the, the pod before, and I find it absolutely amazing. And um, she's now 24 years old, making her the oldest southern sea otter on record. So congratulations. What an amazing legacy and what an amazing example of how care can take a rescued animal that, that would have died in the wild. And uh, instead, she's, she's now the oldest in captivity. Go Monterey Bay Aquarium. Zoo Atlanta has decided to become another one of those uh, wonderful zoos that is transparent about things before they happen by announcing that Leonard, one of the two male reticulated giraffes that lives at the zoo, is going to need to go under anesthesia soon um, because of some problems he's been having. He's been exhibiting some lameness and uh, they're not entirely sure what's going on. So they are going to anesthetize him, do a thorough physical exam, do blood work, collect radio graphs and uh, also do a hoof trim during the procedure. Uh, all of which is very cool and and very important, and you love to see it. But, um, you know, there is a risk associated with anesthesia, especially in giraffes, and Zoo Atlanta just wanted to come out and tell people about that in advance, which is something that I really love and respect. The Australia Zoo has announced that they now have quokkas on exhibit, which is... Really cool and really adorable and also makes sense because they're a very famous Australian animal and it's the Australia Zoo. Uh, if you want to see something really interesting that again gets into 
um, just the amazing work that that zoos do to save species, but also is just a crazy, crazy to see visual. The Denver Zoo has announced that they had to have a CT scan done to a French angelfish. Yep, a CT scan of a fish. It is really wacky to see. So the angelfish in question was experiencing buoyancy issues and swimming abnormally. Uh, and so the uh, vet team sedated the fish and ran water intermittently over its gills while they did an exam and performed a CT scan. The fish was put on a treatment plan and is now doing uh, well back on exhibit. So uh, very, very cool story. But also, again, you just you talk about a fish out of water situation, right? Beardsley Zoo has announced the name of their four baby otters they had earlier this year that we talked about. Uh, and one thing that I really love about this is that since there were four of them, they let their staff name two of them. And then the other two got to be named by the public. I can tell you that zookeepers really like being able to name their animals. So it's cool that they got to name two of these. So the two named by the staff are Wilfred and Mayhem. And the two named by the people are Flo and River. And that brings us to... Stereotypical Animal Podcast theme song. Here to bring you to Conservation News. All right. So last week we mentioned that there has been a lot of really, really good nesting news about sea turtles. And um, now it's time for those nests to start hatching. So just a friendly reminder that if you happen to live or visit coastal areas, please do your part by making sure that you turn your lights off at night so that sea turtles that hatch don't get confused and then swim away from the ocean. Not swim away from the ocean, crawl away away from the ocean. You knew what I meant. So one of the most shocking things in the world to me is that there is still a debate about whether climate change is really happening and is really problematic. Uh, and these next two stories are great examples of the fact that, yeah, no, this is a real thing, y'all. Um, so first of all, huge colonies of emperor penguin chicks saw literally none of their chicks survive last year as the sea ice has been disappearing. Uh, this is this is really heartbreaking, y'all. Four out of five emperor penguin colonies um, west of the Antarctic Peninsula saw no chicks survive last year. Um, and this just happened to be right in an area that experienced an enormous loss of sea ice. Uh, this has been termed a catastrophic breeding failure, and it is the first such recorded incident in history. Uh, and it tends to support the notion that 90% of emperor penguin colonies will be quasi-extinct by 2100 if the world continues to warm like this. It's a real problem, y'all. And, uh, you know, uh, in a very different area... Um, there have been a lot of humpback whales seen feeding in and around the channels of the port of New York and New Jersey this week, including three recently uh, deceased whales that have been found there uh, with signs of being struck by boats. Uh, now, it's interesting because why I'm attributing this to climate change is because there are actually um, mandatory slowdowns for mariners that go into effect uh, to protect North Atlantic right whales from November to April. But now it seems like the whales are showing up to these areas in mass sooner, probably because the water is changing temperature, uh, you know, earlier than expected. And so now the laws aren't actually covering all of the time that various whales are going to be in these areas. So the laws need to be looked at. Uh, boaters need to realize that they need to slow down. But yeah, this is just another example of climate change literally changing things and making it harder for animals to survive. Now, I do have one bit of good news about all of this, and it, it's something that I found um, funny and interesting all at once. 
I try not to get way too into politics on this podcast, but every once in a while, especially when you're talking about conservation, you have to. And in general, uh, it is safe to say that the Republican Party is the party who wants to um, limit regulations and uh, including environmental ones. And uh, that is where you will find most, if not all, of your high profile climate change deniers, right? So it's really interesting to me that uh, this past week, the presidential candidates of the Republican Party, except for Donald Trump, um, got on stage and had a debate on Fox News. OK, so this was as safe of a space as as you could have. And one of the things that Fox News did during the debate was um, they actually tracked uh, what people were thinking live in the moment of each candidate as they spoke. They were doing live at the time polling. And uh, Vivek Ramaswamy got up and called climate change a hoax. And when he did that, his attitude rating dropped from around 50 percent to down to around 15 percent amongst women and um, barely dropped it all amongst men in the audience. Uh <laughs> men anyway um but that's astonishing to me uh that that the women who were watching this on fox news and granted that's the only place it was showing so um you know there were plenty of non-normal fox news people that were watching but uh they were really turned off by ramaswamy saying that climate change is a hoax and that gives me just a lot of really good, warm feelings moving forward, y'all. Um, maybe we can make climate change eventually not be a partisan issue. I, I'm here for that, y'all. A population of water voles has been released back into uh, their British homeland uh, in order to hopefully create a thriving population. And while that's always a great conservation story when something like that happens, this one's extra entertaining to me because they have been released into a secret location uh, so that people stay away and let them do their thing. The location has not been announced, and uh, frankly, I think that's a pretty pretty great idea to be completely honest with y'all uh people can be dumb speaking of reintroductions a large flightless bird known as the takahi has been reintroduced into the alpine slopes of the south island of new zealand uh where it has been extinct for an extended period of time so um sometimes uh in in areas like new zealand uh birds can be interesting because they they evolve to um fill ecosystem niches that mammals would normally occupy and um so yeah the these were basically um bird mammals that that looked very prehistoric they were very broad uh, i think i mentioned they they were flightless um their bodies are almost perfectly spherical and uh they're they're really really beautiful animals um and and they've been gone for a long time but now they have been brought back in a huge conservation win In other news. Wolves in Yellowstone National Park have been observed bringing items back to their den to give to their pups when they have them. Uh, now, wolves will bring food back for their pups, obviously, uh, but they've also been shown to bring back branches and bones and antlers and all kinds of other stuff. Um, the press is generally saying that they're bringing back toys, and that's, I mean, you know, we give our dogs some of those things, so... I get it. Uh, the scientists of the world believe that this is probably something that they evolved simply so that um, the puppies would chew on those things instead of on their parents. Uh, as, as somebody who has recently gone through a bitey puppy with puppy teeth phase, I can tell you uh, it's a really good idea, y'all. Ouch. And I can't even imagine what wolf lit teeth feel like. 
so whether you see it as toys or as a way to, um, you know, self-preserve from from baby bites, uh, it's very cute and definitely worth looking at uh, all of the press about it. It's also just cool to see wolves getting, you know, positive press. Yes, let's associate them with with our dogs to people, please, please. Let's let's do that and, and have them save wolves. All right. <laughs> I have a confession, y'all. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of, of certain shows and movies and stuff. And we've talked about that. I'm a huge Marvel guy, love Star Wars, play my Nintendo Switch, especially Legend of Zelda games like it's going out of style. But I don't think I've ever admitted this to y'all before. Um, I'm a huge Sex in the City fan. I grew up watching that show. I loved it. I owned the DVD box set of every season of that show. And so when it was announced that uh, And Just Like That was coming out, which is the the kind of continuation of the show under a different name, I absolutely knew that I had to be there and watching. And I have watched every single episode the day that it dropped. I love it. It is somewhere between a guilty pleasure and not even a guilty pleasure because I'm not guilty about it. Um, although you can hear in my voice that maybe I'm a little guilty about it. Uh, but anyway... I tell you all of that to tell you that um, this season, uh, there was a new character introduced named Shu. Shu is a tiny cat who uh, goes to live with Carrie Bradshaw. And um, it turns out that Sarah Jessica Parker has adopted the cat that plays Shu in real life. So uh, Carrie and Shu are living together in the real world as well as in fictional Manhattan on and just like that. And I, I really, I love that more than I want to admit. What can I say? It's just great news. And last but not least in other news this week, a, uh, a man was pulled over in Nebraska for having a full-sized Watusi bull named Howdy Doody in his passenger seat. This is insane, and again, something worth looking up online if you want to see the visual of this. Uh, but this large Ford car had had half of the roof cut off so that a Watusi cow could um, just sit in the car as the man with the cow drove down the highway and such. Uh, he was literally driving on Route 275, which is a highway. And um, <laughs> cops started getting calls uh, saying that there was a car driving into town that had a cow in it. And uh, the, the cop who first came on the scene uh, pulled, pulled the man over and did a routine traffic stop and gave him multiple warnings. He was very nice. He only gave him warnings because some of the modifications done to the car were not entirely legal. Um, and there's, uh, there's this really gross picture of the back of the car, which showed that the cow was as cows do just pooping down the, the back and side of the car. So, uh, it's, it's a pretty astonishing thing to see and also pretty darn gross. Uh, but yeah, the cow, uh, the cow was in the car and the owner got a bunch of warnings and was sent on his way out of town. So, um, that's something you can see because of the internet i guess cool oh animal oh, animal animal holidays animal oh, animal animal holidays hey all right and that brings us to our animal holidays for the week and it is a brand new month it is september which is save a tiger month and save the koala month on september 1st we celebrate international primate day the second is International Vulture Awareness Day and National Hummingbird Day. The fourth is National Wildlife Day. And the seventh is both International Manatee Day and Threatened Species Day. And those are your animal holidays for the week. And there you go, folks. Another episode of Raw Safari Zoo News is done. Don't forget that if you see a Zoo News-worthy story, you can tag me in it on social medias at Raw Safari or DM it to me. Uh, it's at Raw Safari Pod on TikTok. Or you can email it to me, Raw Safari Pod at gmail.com. 
Uh, and and I'll say your name, uh, like I'm about to say to the people who who have helped me out with this week's episode. Um, and I also just kind of want to say, going along with my message earlier about how um, you know if I've missed anybody, I apologize. Um, just know that as this podcast has continued to grow, more and more people are contributing, and the contributors are contributing more and more stories. And I super love and appreciate that. I am so grateful to all of y'all for contributing. Uh, but it does mean that more and more stories simply aren't making the cut. I'm determined to keep this to around an hour or less every week. Sometimes I fail a little bit. Um, but I think I could have done an additional 10 amazing stories that people sent me this week that I just wasn't able to make the time for. And we're sitting at just about an hour right now. So um, just wanted to let you know that I do keep those stories. Sometimes they make it in another week. And I do appreciate all of them, whether they make it in or or they don't, uh, you know, from week to week. With all that said, I would like to say thank you to Dr. Lara Shank and Dr. Stephen Williamson, who are my Red Panda level patrons, uh, the highest level of support that you can be for the podcast. And to remind you all that you can support the pod by going to patreon.com slash Rossafari. And uh, you can do so for as little as $3 a month. I'd also like to say thank you to everyone who contributed stories this week, including Anya Keen, Colleen Lenahan, Kim Cooley, Carrie Kirkpatrick, Kevin Williams, Ali Malensky, Kristen Khalil, Ken Tryon, Michaela Baratka, Sherry Weiss, Dr. Laura Shank, Jacob Zinn, Jacob Newman, Emily Rockbuck, Dr. Zoe Rossi, Ali Malensky, Liz Dunlevy, and Melissa Reed. And yes, I realize I just said Ali Malensky twice, but, um... I'm sticking with it. All right. And uh, remember, friends, the words Newsy Credits Backwards are Stiderk Yuswen. The Rossafari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Rossi. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Rossafari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Rossafari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo. A French angelfish. Angelfish. Oh my God, did I just say ang... Oh, John.